uh, and I, our perspective is called a very justice. Um, and basically what we mean by that is uh, striving for the democratization of land access and control. Uh, and we work particularly um, on what we would call the land pillar of food sovereignty. Meaning, uh, you know, it's very difficult to imagine uh, um, having food sovereignty or achieving food sovereignty if you don't have access and control, political decision-making control over how land resources uh, are used. Um, and in sort of policy measures, that means three things um, that it's important to remember in today's sort of land governance context. One is um, uh, respect and uh, protection, recognition, respect, and protection of, uh, of uh, existing mm, uh, situations where uh, poor, vulnerable, and marginalized people um, already have some degree of access and control over their land resources. But it also means looking in places where there is uh, unequal land relations uh, and promoting redistributive land reform. Uh, and the third one is in situations um, which are very prominent in Myanmar, um, where people have uh, lost uh, land access and control because of reasons like armed conflict or um, uh, massive floods like what are happening now uh, and the big typhoon Nargis, cyclone Nargis uh, uh, in 2008. Yeah. Um, and so um, uh, the, the policy measure there is, is restitution. Um, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of uh, IDPs and refugees um, uh, moving around the, the border areas uh, of Myanmar, for example, um, and within Myanmar, um, who used to be on land and um, are no longer uh, able to be there. Um, um, the issue of land has become really prominent, as many of you know, in the last few years, uh, um, in relation to, to what uh, uh, has sort of become to known as the global land grab. Um, uh, and this has been a really sort of revelatory uh, experience for somebody like me who's worked on land issues for um, maybe 20 years. Um, you know, 10 years ago, people would glaze over when you start to, to talk about land issues. Um, and then suddenly it became, you know, the flavor of the month. And it's, um, uh, it's brought many voices that weren't there before, many new voices uh, sort of into the room um, uh, and attracted a lot of attention. Um, uh, and uh, it's conversed with um, sort of new processes of uh, international standard setting uh, around land and natural resources, but particularly land that's, that's sort of um, uh, dovetailing with long time advocacy uh, on the part of like the World Bank for um, uh, land formalization uh, projects. Um, uh, and so we've been sort of analyzing the, the different sort of political responses to this, um, and we've, we've come up with this uh, sort of uh, analysis that there are basically three broad tendencies, political tendencies. We call the first one regulate uh, to facilitate land grabs. Um, uh, and you can imagine, you know, sort of who are the forces behind this. Um, uh, and this includes uh, um, facilitating moving people off the land altogether or facilitating incorporating people into new economic arrangements like contract growing and, and other sorts of things. A second tendency is what we call regulate to mitigate, which is sort of, you know, uh, uh, allowing land grabbing to happen but putting a kind of human happy face on it. Um, uh, and a lot of times the argument here from, from some, uh, I would say from some big uh, NGO forces in particular, um, is that the situation on the ground is so urgent and it's virtually impossible to stop. Uh, and so the only choice we have is to uh, mitigate. Um, alongside that is a third tendency, um, and that's mainly um, where we situate ourselves um, at TMI, um, and that's regulated to uh, resist and roll back land grabbing. Um, and this is very um, yeah, meaningful for a lot of the social movement groups that we work with. Um, uh, so you can see from this that there are different purposes for these, uh, um, there are these various international regulatory initiatives are bringing together forces with very different 
purposes in mind uh, for regulation. Um, uh, so that's one sort of aspect of the thing. Um, a third point I wanted to make is that uh, today, um, activists from different types of movements are finding themselves in uh, the same sort of global and national uh, policy spaces or finding that there are sort of uh, opportunities to come into the same spaces. Um, uh, but they're bringing different angles in politics. Um, uh, many justices, as it were, agrarian justice, environmental justice, water justice, climate justice, um, uh, and human rights. Mm, uh, as well as um, encountering or, or engaging with peasant movements, fisher movements, um, um, indigenous movements. Um, and it would seem like um, it would be, there would be, these would be spaces for natural allies to come together. But as it turns out in, in my experience, um, it's not, uh, it's a challenge to work together. Um, uh, uh, and we don't always, sort of uh, automatically see eye to eye on many of the details of, um, of uh, land policy or land rights uh, uh, and other related uh, resource issues. Um, things like you know, what does environmental justice mean? What does climate justice mean? What does water justice mean? As I think we saw from the panel uh, yesterday, uh, the parallel session on water justice. Um, what does sovereignty mean? Is it from below or is it, uh, you know, um, uh, centered in the state? Um, mm, uh, just as I mentioned, the, the issue of uh, regulation. Um, even the concept of land rights is highly contested. Uh, and the issue of human rights is highly contested. Um, but uh, to shift the balance of power, um, we really maybe need to um, uh, not just, uh, I'm trying to be a little clever here, not just mind the gap, uh, but somehow try to find ways to bridge the gaps between us. Um, uh, and maybe there's a need to, to <coughs> do some of the hard work of shifting from uh, sort of add and stir to finding ways to have more chemistry with each other. Um, uh, and. I want to try to illustrate that with, uh, or illustrate the challenge uh, with some um, uh, just observations from a recent uh, month-long uh, uh, field work that I was in uh, in, the, in Myanmar. Um, uh, uh, on the ground, what I saw is that there are um, there seem to be some gaps that are creating opportunities uh, to capture initiatives and discourse around climate change. So for example, uh, or, or the result is that um, uh, there's, on the ground, there's, a, there's an active reframing of all kinds of uh, resource grabbing issues as climate change mitigation, or resource grabbing <coughs> as climate change mitigation. So for example, um, uh, you know, tree planting, reforestation projects that are being uh, used to actually reduce the space for shifting cultivation practices which are portrayed as causing deforestation uh, and increasing GHG emissions. Um, even one sort of outrageous example is that uh, uh, there, is a, there are narratives circulating on the ground uh, that, that uh, um, climate change is being, global warming is being caused by hot elements in the ground and they need to be extracted in order to... Um, uh, yeah, uh, but I mean, these are real things that are happening. Um, and somehow we're not on the ground enough or in the right ways to counter these narratives. They're growing and we need to stop this. Um, uh, another major uh, area that I see big problems is um, um, I think there are gaps and weaknesses in what I would say are explicitly social justice oriented human rights work that's creating openings and opportunities for the, the facilitate and mitigate tendencies that I just mentioned to capture land rights uh, and human rights discourse around struggles. And this means reducing land rights to technical, uh, narrow interpretations of individual private land titles, where villagers are delinked from their social, economic, cultural uh, context or complex, 
um, and fixing them into uh, economistic uh, uh, um, places uh, tied to uh, agricultural plots. Um, and there's a sort of new one that's emerging or, or emerging, let's say, in a more uh, definitive way, um, this idea of responsible land acquisition discourse that's uh, actually serving as a veil to remove options uh, before people are even able to think of them as legitimate options for them. Meaning, so many times I go around and people say uh, to me, people who are, whose lands have been confiscated or are uh, they're being told that they're being confiscated, that um, uh, uh, the main thing that they can do is go for uh, compensation. Um, and what I would like to point out is that there are uh, elite actors, both I think from the government, from companies, and from big NGOs that are saying, you know, basically you should vacate and you know, we will try to uh, organize it so that you get compensation. Um, and if you compare that to the actually existing international human rights law uh, uh, found expressed in the UN guidelines of addiction and displacement, and really read through the content of that, you will see that there is a very high standard in place uh, on, on what needs to happen before uh, displacement and addictions happen, during and after. And these are tools that we should use as political leverage in our, in our struggles. Um, I have some other things that I would like to say, but uh, I guess uh, it will be maybe brought in a little bit. Thank you.